Turn it up. All right. Well, good evening. Welcome to Longview Bible Baptist Church. Looking forward to a great service in the Lord's house together tonight. Let's stand together as we begin. We'll start by singing Only a Sinner tonight. That's hymn number 304 in your hymn book. Or if you have faith, look at the screens. Amen. Looks like we have people of faith tonight. I like that. And on that first verse, not all I will take, but what I for some announcements. Good evening. Good evening. I'm only a sinner saved by grace, but what a great place to be. Amen. <laughs> well, we'll take a quick look at the announcements. Of course, Father's Day is coming up this Sunday, so there'll be no uh, afternoon service this Sunday. Uh, there's uh, the, uh, the church camps for the juniors and the seniors are going on and and uh, parents, if you have any questions at all, just see Pastor. There's been a, a change, I think, made for the senior camp, uh, and it's going to be shorter, and the cost has gone down. Uh, but see Pastor about that. I don't have all the details, and, and I don't want to speculate on that. Uh, just a quick look. Of course, in your bulletin at the bottom, Stu always puts that calendar in there. Just want to remind you and, and invite any of the men, uh, young or old, uh, you're more than welcome to join us for our men's prayer time at Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. And then certainly every Sunday afternoon after the afternoon service, there is uh, the uh, ensemble practice. Probably won't be happening on Father's Day. <laughs> All right. Uh, then let's see. Monday night is about the only night that there's not something uh, happening. Tuesday night, there's a soul winning and uh, a discipleship class, both at 6.30. Ladies' prayer on Wednesday night before the service is here at 6. Uh, Thursday, of course, are you, uh, takes place. Friday uh, mornings is the ladies' Bible study. Uh, I think there's just, I don't know how many weeks it's going to be, but there's two lessons left in the book that they're using. And when they're done with that, why, they'll take their summer break like they do every year. And then Saturday, opportunity for soul winning. And, boy, you might want to get out early this Saturday. It's going to be gorgeous. It's going to be beautiful out there. So uh, baby shower for Juliet. That's coming up. That's going to be July 3rd. That's a Saturday, uh, right before uh, July 4th and all the fireworks. 
And I guess that's all I got for you. It's a good night to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Pastor. Thank you, Brother Rob. Let's stand again as we continue to worship tonight. And we will sing grace greater than our sin. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Amen. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Let's lift up our voices to the Lord tonight. Marvelous grace of our just so we can get on the same page. So you're going to go grace, grace, God's grace, and then you guys are the repeat, okay? And if you don't know the repeat, somebody else over here does, so sing what they're doing, okay? <laughs> all right. Now that we're all on the same page, relatively slow, let's sing that last verse up to the Lord. On the last verse. Marvelous God's grace. Well, let's go ahead and take the time and uh, we'll pray for the offerings. We have the offering plates up here. And uh, so, Brother Dave Barnes, would you just want to bless Before the offerings we tonight? Do that, we had a benevolence Ooh, um, yeah. this past week that we already took care of, but many of us committed to it. I just want to remind you of that benevolence. So, and if you just want to give to that, that's fine. But, um, and you can drop that in, obviously, not, not right now during, but if you mark it uh, other. On your offering envelope, you can bring it up, or you can put it in later afterwards. That's fine as well. So, All right. Brother Dave. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your, your infinite grace. Lord, thank you for all so much you do for us, everything you bestow upon us, both with money, with family, with friends, everything you give to us, Lord. Please help us to bear that in mind and be willing to give back to you. Uh, thank you for everything our church does. And help us to continue being able to do that, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
beautiful. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and stand again. Let's sing our last song tonight. It's called I Will Praise Him. Let's sing the first, the third, and the last tonight. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. We're looking at Nehemiah chapter 2. In the book of Nehemiah chapter 2. And uh, we have, I still have not, um, I was hoping that by the time I got through uh, some of these, did I, I didn't just mute this, did I? Yep. Oh, you guys had it on the whole time? Please tell me you had it off while it was on. Okay. Good to know. Nehemiah chapter 2, um, we've been talking about the four characteristics that make a church successful, and I've been kind of bouncing back and forth between Sundays with this <clears throat> and between uh, Wednesdays. Um, I'm still praying about what, what series to start, um, uh, what portion, what, what book of the Bible to do um, for our Wednesdays. We just finished up 2 Timothy, and before that it was 1 Timothy, and before that... Um, I can't remember if it was Philippians or Colossians, and a couple years before that, it was 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and we've, we've covered a, most of Paul's epistles um, uh, throughout the, our Wednesday nights, and so I'm still kind of, um, I'm thinking maybe the Bible's run out of material for us. <laughs> I'm just kidding, never, never. So, but no, I'm just praying about it, so uh, just be praying. Some of you have given me some ideas. Uh, I've kind of batted around Hebrews. I like Hebrews. Um, many don't think Paul wrote that. I tend to think he did, but, um, you know, could be wrong on that. Who knows? But uh, four characteristics that will make a church successful in Nehemiah chapter 2. And we're just going to read verses 17 and 18. And if you're there and you're able to, could you stand with me in reverence to God's word tonight? Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible says, Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth in waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build 
So they straight, strengthened their hands for this good work. We've been talking about four characteristics that make a church or a Christian successful. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We praise you for your word. And God, I just pray, Father, that you'd speak to each one of our hearts tonight. Lord, we are so thankful for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, just reminded of that tonight. And God, I pray for those that are struggling right now and just circumstances. I know that there are many. And and God, we uh, we just lift up our brothers and sisters before you. I pray, Father, that we as a church would be what we're supposed to be, that we would edify and encourage one another. God, we do thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. You may be seated. All right, four characteristics that make the church successful. Number one, a long-winded preacher. That makes a church successful. Number one, learn to encourage others. We've already talked about this, but it's probably one of the most important on this list. Uh, One of the commands to go to church is not that you and I get fed spiritually and all those things are important. Obviously, a church is the pillar and ground of the truth, needs to preach the gospel, but people need to be edified. They need to be built up. They need to be encouraged. They need to be uh, 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 lifted. And sometimes edification isn't always uh, without some hurt. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Sometimes building a life means... There are things that have to be addressed in it, but, but that's, we need to be encouraging. We need to, to lift one another up. Uh, you get encouraged by helping others, uh, and you get something done. So be encouraging. Be encouraging. Uh, and we talked about the mentality of encouragement. Uh, number two on our list was, and I, I like this one uh, because I think it's something that's missing in a lot of new evangelical churches Uh, charismatic churches, but learn to be embarrassed. I've been in churches that I'm like, why aren't these people embarrassed? This is exactly what the world looks like. This is exactly what the world does. Uh, Why do we have to take on the characteristics of the world uh, to to win the world? You know, when, when I, when I go to, if I go to a, somebody who's like a, a fitness guru or something like that, I don't know. It's just there's something in my mind that thinks this guy should be fit. He shouldn't be fat like everybody else. And, uh, and, and you're looking for something different. Listen, the Bible, uh, the Bible is the manual. It's the guideline for godly living. One of the things as a church that we have to understand, part of encouragement is, is for us to stem, stem the tide. One of the, one of the biggest themes in the Bible From Genesis to the Kings to the Judges, all the way into the New Testament and to the seven churches of Asia at the end. One of the biggest themes in the Bible is Christians that, or believers I should say, that compromise their faith over and over and over again. And uh, we understand that prophecy tells us that in the end times there's going to be a falling away. Uh, What that's going to look like, what that's going to mean, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not smart enough to make to, to con- make any conjecture on that, but, um, but we know that it's going to happen. Make sure that as we're encouraging one another, uh, that we are, uh, that we're also, um, no, the second point was embarrassment. Make sure that when we look at things, we have a level of shame. That's what I want to say. That we have a level of shame. One of the things that uh, we looked at in Jeremiah was, the, the Israel got to the point where they couldn't blush anymore. They weren't embarrassed of anything. And, uh, and you'll see that with Christians. Uh, oftentimes the things that are posted on Facebook, the things that they'll put on Instagram, there's just, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, I, I had a youth director one time that told me, he said, the worst thing that a teen can say to you, it's not that I hate you, it's when they fold their arms and you're talking to them and they're just looking right through you and going, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Because at least when you're getting an emotional response, you're still affecting them. But when you're telling them something and they just kind of blow it off and it's no big deal, um, that is a total quenching of the Spirit. Uh, And oftentimes, too, the scary thing about that is they can sin without any conscience at all. And that that is such a dangerous place for a person to be is... um, uh, when they can sin and it doesn't bother them. Pastor Yant gave a, um, 
uh, a testimony in the youth department here not too long ago. And he talked about that when he was younger. He said, you know, after I got saved, when I sinned, it bothered me. What a shame for somebody who's proclaiming the name of Christ that they can be in sin and there's, they're, they're not even affected by it. That, that is so dangerous for you to be in. Don't, don't be that way. Or that you have no shame, that there's no embarrassment. And there's a lot of things that you and I ought to be and, and should be rightfully embarrassed over. Um, times when people come into our church and things are in total disarray. And, you know, that there should be a level of, uh, of this is God's house. And we've talked about that here not too long ago in a separate sermon. Um, but the way that the Bible is preached in our church, it, it ought to be the church should be the pillar and ground of the truth. That's the job of the church. Uh, the, the, the church, and there are some pillars and grounds that aren't very beautiful, but, uh, or that are poorer than others. But that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the church is supposed to lift this up. This needs to be preeminent. Uh, unfortunately, way too many churches are opulent, beautiful, grand pianos, beautiful facilities, all these other things. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But if the Bible is not the center of that church... It doesn't meet the qualifications of what a true church is. The Bible tells us that the church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth. Number three, we talked about, and this was the last one, we talked about learning to trust God. Learn to trust God. Uh, Nehemiah showed confidence when he approached them on that wall, about the building those walls. He said, hey, we don't want to be a reproach anymore. He showed embarrassment, but he also showed confidence in God. He trusted God in it. Uh, and, 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 and he basically said, hey, let's, let's go forward with this. Uh, I, one of my favorite illustrations of the hymns is when uh, uh, D.L. Moody or Dwight L. Moody, when he was preaching revivals, uh, he went to Ira Sankey. And Ira Sankey was a, an amazing musician. And he went to him and he said, I want you to travel with me. Well, Ira Sankey had already gotten some offers that were far more lucrative than what D.L. Moody was going to give him. At least that's what Ira Sankey thought. And it uh, got to the point where he finally tells D.L. Moody, he says, you know, he goes, I just don't know that I have a, the faith to take this step. And D.L. Moody said, well, then borrow some of mine. And of course, we know the story. Ira Sankey ended up traveling with D.L. Moody, and many of our hymns today that we have in that old hymnal were written by Ira Sankey. Um, what a testimony. What a blessing. Uh, all through the Bible, we see people borrowing the faith of others. The, four, uh, Paul, the, the, the one that was carried uh, with palsy by his companions. The Bible says that Jesus looked at their faith and said, thy sins be forgiven me. We can't, get, we can't get saved for anyone. We know that. That's a personal decision. But oftentimes, we can bring people to Christ to the point where they, they accept Jesus. They accept His healing. Those men tore the, the roof apart to lower that man in front of the Savior. Listen, you and I ought to have faith. But number four tonight, and our final point, learn to work. Learn to work. To work. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18, he says, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. The word strengthen means to fasten upon, hence to seize, be strong. It wasn't just a pep rally. He didn't just show up on the walls a few days. Have you ever had something at work, at school, or at school, and you're expected to make an appearance at? This wasn't that. This wasn't that. He got in. He committed. He became a part. He put his life on hold. Uh, he was the king's cupbearer. He left that so he could go and he could serve God. Uh, what I love about it, too, is he didn't pick and choose. He became committed to the ultimate goal. He knew that God would bless them. He believed that God would do it. He also encouraged and believed in the, in the people that he was around, that they could do the job. 
Uh, but he didn't expect them to do it alone. I think Pastor Stewart handed out those cards not too long ago, and he, he asked a series of questions of the church, and everyone rated the church. He goes, how, how good of a, a soul-winning church do you think this church is? And of course, people rated the church high, but then when he said on an individual basis, how good of a soul winner are you? And people rated themselves low. Well, we can't all be rated low and the church be rated high because there's, it takes us, it takes the individuals in the church to do it, to, to be. Uh, and, and, and I can't remember all of those questions, but that's the one that sticks out to me. Um, but you can, you can mark it down that if you're not pulling your way, somebody's picking up the slack. Somebody's going to have to do it. Success never happens without effort. If you ever watch or listen to a passionate entrepreneur, you quickly learn it's not just about a good product or service that an entrepreneur or an investor presents. It's every bit as much as the work that they're willing to put into it. And I'm amazed at how many of people will start a business or they'll start a job or or, or, or they'll take on something and they'll sacrifice everything for it. They'll mortgage their homes. They'll sell their possessions because they believe their product is the next best thing. And they, they believe there's gonna be, they're going to reap rewards. And here, tonight, God's people sit on the best news that man has ever been given. I remember when I was in Bible college, I led this guy to the Lord. I will never for the rest of my life forget what he told me after he got saved. He said, Darren, he goes, why haven't I heard this before? I mean, I've heard about Jesus Christ, but I've always heard, you know, you're a good person, you're this or you're that. He's like, why haven't I heard this before? He's like, why isn't there people that have just set up booths on the side of the freeway that say, come here and get saved? I mean, that, that was his mindset. He was just like, this is like so good. Why isn't it just readily available to everybody? And I, and I think about all of the different perspectives, all the programs that we, all the, all the different angles that we try to get the gospel into people's hands. And this guy just broke it down. He's like, why don't you guys just set up a booth that says, get saved here. And that, that just made total sense to him. And I, you know, sometimes we... We get so bogged down in the complexity of trying to get to all these arguments. I can't tell you how many times I have prayed over a soul, showed up at their door, and they got saved. And, and I had stressed about all these different things, and all it took was just, God, give me an opportunity. When the opportunity came, God, open their eyes, open their ears. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to get saved. But I'm blown away at how many times, how I, I, I'm always struck by the ease of it. I remember one time, me and Bob Shuny, I'll never forget this. We show, he shows up, and he's all pumped up. He's like, let, 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 let's go give someone the gospel. I, I don't want to just hand somebody a track. He's like, Pastor, I want to give somebody the gospel tonight. And I looked at him, I said, Bob, I'll make a commitment. I won't stop until somebody gets saved. He goes, me neither. And we got on our knees and we're like, God, give us somebody tonight. The first door that we went to, we're like, we're giving this guy the gospel. If we have to force feed him, we're giving him the gospel. And, uh, and so we went to the door, and I'm not saying this is always the best way to approach it, but... We went to the door and everything that I knew to do, I did. And then finally, it was just kind of, we're talking about the, his trees, we're talking about his car, we're talking about all these different things. And, 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 and finally, you know, I, I just said, listen, if, if you were to die today, do you know that you're going to go to heaven? Do you know that? No, I don't. He invited us in. We went over the scriptures. A few minutes later, I mean, it's happened so fast. A few minutes later, he was asking, I want to get saved. I want to know. 
It doesn't always happen like that, obviously. But the point I'm making tonight is that often we make it a lot harder than it really is. I mean, when you watch Jesus lead people to the Lord, be it the woman at the well or whatever, it's not a difficult thing. And, and I think we get so bogged down in, in, in all the other things and people are like, man, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I can answer the questions. And listen, there will be hard questions, but I, you ever just get to the point where you're like, man, I, I, let's just do it. It's time to get into the work. I, I like working with people that don't, don't make you sit there and think too much. And, uh, and, and, I, and I am... Like, I don't mind calculating and planning something out, but I worked with this guy years ago. And like, we wouldn't even start work till like, by the time he was done figuring out what he wanted to do and the supplies that needed to be there, it was time for lunch. And it, it just used to drive me nuts. I like it when it's like, we need to do this, this, this needs to be there, let's do this. We can get this thing done in five hours if we get on this. And, uh, and, and I like that. I enjoy that. I, I, I like, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that I have to think about things so much in this job. I like it when I go into a job and I don't have to think. I can just do it. I can just this way, this way. You want this done? Okay, cool, cool, cool. I remember Pastor Stewart is very much that way and uh, me and Bill Byers work together sometimes, and he's, he's a lot like that too. But um, I remember we were working on the house next door, and Bob is one of those that he comes into a job, and he's like, whoa, hold up, hold up. What are we doing? I mean, typical uh, uh, job manager, you know, that's what he's doing. And I remember we were, they were putting uh, um, uh, like trim or something in place, and he's lining it up and everything, and Pastor Stewart just comes and goes, looks good, thum, 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 thum. And you could see Bob just like, uh. yeah. and, uh, and you know, it, it's, you need, you need both types of people, but you know, sometimes there's, it's very true, the paralysis of analysis. You know what? If you know how to get saved, you know how to tell people how to get saved. Start doing it. Start doing it. And then, and then, you know what? You, you'll get the questions, you'll get the things, you'll get the hard hits, you'll, you'll get the ones that, yeah, but you never learn unless you just go out there. It's like swimming. Someone can tell you how to swim a million times, and until somebody just drop kicks you in the water and you're swimming for your life, that's the best lesson of swimming that there is. Hopefully you don't drown. But, but that's, that's the way it is with, with, you need people that'll just get in there and work. Um, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, the Bible says, um, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his, to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Um, listen, I, I, I love it when people know their Bible. And, uh, and we have great theologians in this church. Um, some are visiting with us tonight. Know their Bible. But listen, when it comes right down to it, Jesus didn't ask for the theologians. He asked for laborers. It's, we need to get into the harvest. We need to do the work. We need to tell people about the Lord. Uh, listen, sometimes giving money is a whole lot easier than giving of yourself. Uh, you know, I believe it's one of the problems with America. We are always throwing more money at a problem. I mean, that's the answer in America. Uh, you know, education in America stinks. Let's put more money into it. And uh, well, education in America still stinks. Let's put more money into it. Uh, California uh, uh, Portland, Seattle spend more money on homelessness than pretty much any other city in the, in, in the United States. Cities, and they still, not only do they have a problem with homelessness, their homelessness has exploded. Money is not always the answer. As a matter of fact, seldom is it the answer. You need people that are committed to it. 
And you know, it's one of the things that back in the old days in, the, in, in America, people were willing to sacrifice for their neighbors. I remember hearing stories of my grandpa, you know, helping save crops of their neighbors and, and working long days side by side with their neighbors and helping one another out. Um, now, many of us, we don't really even know our neighbors. You know, that, that's part of the problem in our country today. Unfortunately, it's often part of the problem in our church today, too, is that uh, we really don't know one another. We really don't know much about the struggles that people are going through, and we haven't really invested time. We haven't really sacrificed. Listen, success doesn't happen without effort. It doesn't happen without work. And when the work comes, don't disqualify God's work. In Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1, I think this is probably the premier chapter of Nehemiah. It's Nehemiah chapter 3. The Bible says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brother and the priests, and they builded the sheep gate, and they sanctified it, and they set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it under the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next unto them builded Zakor, the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanai uh, build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berchiah, uh, the son of uh, Meshizabil. And next unto them repaired Zodak, the son of Bana. Next unto them the Tekoites repaired. But listen to this. But their nobles, but not their necks to the work of the Lord. Interesting. It doesn't say, but their servants put not their neck to the work. The Bible is clear to show us their nobles. These were the ones that were higher up. And, and you know... It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor of the church. There are times where things just need to get done, and we need people that are willing to get them done. Listen, I love the idea and believe in the idea of spiritual gifts. I don't, I don't discount spiritual gifts at all. But I'll tell you one of, the, one of the issues I have when I hear people bring up the spiritual gifts or having certain spiritual gifts, because we all have them. I believe that we all have certain gifts that God has given to us. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you the difference between differentiating between an ability and a gift and some of those things. But any time I hear somebody start talking about their spiritual gift, I, I, I kind of cringe a little bit. Uh, because it is always a reason to disqualify Fulfilling a need in a church. You're not always going to, the, the need is not always going to be your spiritual gift or the thing that you think it should be. Listen to this. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 13, the valley of the gate, and, and further down in our text here, the whole of Nehemiah 3 is them repairing the, their section of the wall, their gate. And, and every, everybody had a piece of the pie, all the way from the beginning of Nehemiah 3 to the end. That's the whole chapter. But Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says, The valley gate repaired Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoah. They built it they, and, and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof and a thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. But the dung gate repaired Melchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of beth Herakim. He built it, set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Now, now there were some gates, and, and if you ever read through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, if you ever read the book of Job, or you read a, a Proverbs, or the Bible talks about that the elders would sit at the gates. Now, Job says that when he came to the gates that the, the honorable men would put their hand over their mouth because he was that honorable to people. The gates were where a lot of the judicial things happened, but not at the dung gate. Oh, the fish gate, that's the market. 
That, that, was, that was a place of, of commerce and, and, and we could go to each individual gates. The gates all meant something and, and people hung out there, but you didn't, you didn't see, you know, you didn't see a couple of, uh, of, of honorable elders saying, you know, this gate's a little crowded. Let's go hang out at the dung gate. Nobody, hang, nobody hung out at the dung gate. You got away from the dung gate as quick as you could because it's the dung gate. I don't think I have to explain that. <laughs> but you know the thing is, is every, every city has to have one. They gotta have one. Years ago, me and Brother Byers were working on this, um, this dock and at the boathouses a lot of times what happens is uh, you'll have a boathouse that'll, if it has sewer in it, it'll feed into like a sump pump or something along those lines. We worked on one and it had a series of boathouses. They all had these individual pumps uh, that, that would, uh, the, the toilets would flush into and then uh, this pump would kick on when, when it got to a certain level and they went, then they went into this great big dung gate, if you will. And then up the ramp, it would go, it, this thing would, would, when it got full, it would turn on. And then up the ramp, and it was a pipe, well, like a three, four inch pipe. It was pretty good size, four inch pipe. It went up the side of the ramp. Well, this thing got a leak in it. And they called. And every time that thing would turn on, Old Faithful would blow. Just so you know, it wasn't white steam. It, would, it was going all over the ramp, the whole thing. And him and I, not only did, did, I think he fixed that, but then after that we had to dive down into the water and underneath those, those, a couple of those sump pumps, one guy, he had some renovation done on this one. You'll remember this one well because we both were like getting out of that water quick. But the sump pump was, it was in the water. It's half in the water. If it works, it's okay. But what was happening is they just unplugged it like five years ago. And so raw sewage was just overflowing off of this thing straight into, and, and we had to fix it. So we're down there in the water. Both of us are grossed out. But, you know, somebody's got to do the work. You know, you, you, a lot of times people don't want to be the plumber. Nowadays, plumbers make really good money, but a lot of times people don't want to be the plumber. But man, you're sure glad when you have one. But I want you to notice something about the guy working at the dung gate. His name was Melchiah, but look at who he is. He's the son of Rechab. Now, many of you have heard messages on the Rechabites out of Jeremiah. I don't know. There were other Rechabs in the Bible. There are four. Two of them are Arab, two of them are Israelites. But there's a lot of reason to think this guy was a Rechabite. And if this guy was a Rechabite, we already see he's in a position of honor. The Bible says he was part ruler of an area. If this guy was a Rechabite, his family has been recorded years before by Jeremiah, the prophet. His family was pointed out as one of the most honorable families in all of Israel. And how unique is it that, man, this guy, if anybody should claim nobility, if anyone should say no, I'm working on the sheep gate. I'm working on the fish gate. I'm working on the gate that the elders are going to sit at, that they're going to admire the work that I've done for years and go, one of the Rechabites built this. He's working on the dung gate. Do you think he thought that was his spiritual gift? You know, I, I'm from an honorable family. And let me just tell you, I think my spiritual gift is to work on the toilets. You know, oftentimes we disqualify God because we see what it entails. 
And, 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 and sometimes people say, well, that's not really my gift, or I'm not really interested. I'm not really interested in that. I, could you imagine if you told your boss that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll do everything else that I'm, you've asked me to do. But I, I'm, I'm, you know, I know it's part of my job description. <laughs> but no, no, you need to hire somebody else. I love what Tim Stewart says. Uh, he said to an employee years ago, he looked at him, an employee he was having problems with, and he looked at him and he said, I am confident that either you or your replacement can accomplish this task. <laughs> Lastly, with being not disqualifying the work of God, um, and, and listen, for some of you young men, uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 27, it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Learn to be a good worker. Learn to be a good worker. I think one of the aspects of being a good worker that's often overlooked, and people look at the guy that, man, he'll get in, he'll get things done, and on and on and on and on. But, you know, I remember when uh, I was dealing with, uh, uh, with one of my sons, physical ability, dis his disabilities, and I told him, I said, you're probably with your back and some of the other things that you're dealing with, you're probably, you're not gonna, probably not going to be able to outwork everybody. But I told him, I said, one of the things you can be is don't ever call in sick. You just show up, you go. I mean, you may not be able to lift as much as this guy. You may not be able to work as much, but let them see. And I told him, I said, it says something when you show up to a job and the boss has to send you home. If he thinks you're too sick, make him send you home. You know, He's never been fired from a job. Part of it is because it's easy in this day and age. If you just show up, you're a good employee. But that's the second part of this too, is don't be flighty. There's a lot of people that are really good in the work of God when they're there. But they're so often that they're not there. They're not around. They're not available. They're, um, you know, that, and listen, I, I get the idea that we all can't do everything but we all can do something. The something that you have, be faithful at it. Be faithful at it. Uh, uh, make sure that people see you putting forth the effort. It's good for people to see you doing your job tired. It's good for people to see you doing your job when you're, you're dragging to do it. It's good for people to see that sometimes. It, it, it's good for people to know that, man, this guy just got done with this, and now he's doing that. I'll tell you one of the things that absolutely impressed me with Pastor Stewart when I first started training him was he would work all day, and then the next thing I know at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, he'd be knocking on my window. Pastor, Pastor, are you awake? <laughs> like the lights are off. I'd tell my wife, I'm like, at the time, I was still young. I'd tell my wife, I'd be like, where does this kid get his energy? She's like, I don't know. There were times where I would send her, I'm like, find out what he wants. I got to get some sleep. But, but I loved that. I love that doggedness, that, that, that don't give up, don't quit. In Titus chapter 2, verse 1, Paul loves the same thing. Or 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul loves the same thing about somebody. It's like that. He says in 2 Timothy 2, 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. It ain't going to be easy. It's tough. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Well, what is he saying here? He's saying don't be the guy that always has an excuse, that always has a reason. There will always be something in the world that's going to stand in your way. There's always going to be a reason. There's always going to be something that stops you. There's always going to be a reason to quit. 
there's always going to be a reason not to push on and to keep going. They'll always come. No man that within, warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Paul didn't let his infirmity of the flesh distract him. He didn't let his inability distract him. Oh, there's so many people that can do it better. Are they doing it? No. Okay, well then you're the best one. If we can't count on them, you're the best one. Just do it. Just get in there. You know, my brother told me when I first went, and this is one of the things you need to know about a spiritual gift. If you would have asked me when I first started what my spiritual gifts were, the teens would not have been even on the top 10 or tw top 20 list. And he told me, he goes, listen, I have a guy in this church that was just a phenomenal, and that's what he told me. This is a phenomenal youth director. He was awesome with teens. He goes, but I couldn't count on him. And he says, I, we really need, we have teens, we really need a youth department. And I'm like, I haven't taken one class, one course. He goes, well, figure it out, get in there, do it. That first youth department, I lost all but one and she ran away. And this is a sad thing. I didn't blame her. And then the second one, it got a little better. And then by the time I got that third group of kids in that class, I'm like, you know, I really love this. When I came to this church, I will never forget, Carrie and I, went to a youth, a, a youth uh, activity with the kids that I had been their youth director. And they were telling our kids, they're like, he left us. He, we're bummed. You guys stole our, our, our favorite youth director. And you know, when I first went in there, the guy that went in was awesome. But they just couldn't count on him. They couldn't count on him. Nobody could count on him. Uh, listen, uh, it doesn't matter how good you are. Can people count on you? One of God's favorite attributes in his people throughout the Bible is faithfulness. And listen, this is the cool thing about faithfulness is that God doesn't expect you to be the most talented. He doesn't expect you to be the smartest. He doesn't expect you to be the most gifted. Everyone in this room can be faithful. That, that is the number one thing that I think makes a great servant of the Lord. And I think the Bible agrees with it. Listen to what he says. He tells Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier. He tells him, train people who are faithful. Because they'll train others also. But listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. He says this to the church of Corinth. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith... Quit you like men, be strong. That word quit literally means to stand, to keep going. We think of quit, we think, oh, we're done. That's not what that means. He says, watch ye, stand fast, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Let all things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, you know how the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. He uses Stephanus, which many believe in 1 Corinthians 16, to be the pastor of Corinth. I would agree with that. But the Bible says that he addicted himself to the ministry. It's one of the only times in the Bible the word addicted is used. We think of an addict, we think of somebody who is so addicted to a substance that it takes precedent in every part of their life. They're a drug addict. He says he addicted himself to the work of the mystery. But look at this. I want you to look at this. When After he tells them to stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, listen to what he says. This is important tonight, and I'll close with this. I mean it. I will. He says, let all your things be done with charity. You tell me tonight why he says that. Why does he say that? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Why does he tell them, quit you like men, don't stop, and do everything in charity? Can I tell you tonight? Because I already read it. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, the Bible talks about charity. It suffers long. It does everything. But you know what? The one thing it will never do, it won't quit. Charity never faileth. You ever meet that mom that that kid is just, it, he's rebellious. He's, he's out, of, out of church. He's, he, 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 he misuses his mom. He, he's been a constant heartache and that mom won't let go. Why? Because charity never faileth. It never quits. It never stops. When you and I stop loving, we stop doing. When we get to the point that we, our charity is gone, our effort will be gone too. We'll quit. We'll give up. And listen, that, that's the key to the work of God. If you're going to be good at it, you got to love it. You got to love it. Uh, you have to care about people. You have to care about uh, the, the ones that are in your life. You've got to care about the world. The, why did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he not stop at, at, at the beatings? Why not stop when the, the weight crushed him? Why didn't he stop? Why didn't he give up? Because the Bible says God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know why I've given up on people? I didn't love them like I should. Do you know why we give up on the work of God? Why we give up on things? We don't love it. I remember three years after Michael Jordan had won th three championships in a row, he retired, and I'll never forget what he said. I liked basketball at the time. I haven't watched a basketball game since... 2001 or 2002, like an NBA game. I, I, I haven't sat down and watched a full NBA game in that amount of time. But when he retired, he sat there and all this crowd was waiting to hear from the greatest basketball player that many believed had ever lived on the face of the earth. And as those lights shone on him and as everyone was looking at him and the whole thing, I'll never forget his words. He said, you know, and when I got to the point that I didn't love it anymore, I, 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 I decided I'd go do something else. And almost a dazed look in his face. I fear many Christians have got to that point. Galatians says, Be not weary in well doing, for in due season ye shall reap if ye faint not. But if just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it'd be worth every struggle. It would be worth every trial. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all if it rescues just one more soul. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, four characteristics of success. To encourage Learn to encourage, to be embarrassed. Learn to work. Christian, are you doing those things? Are, are, are you having, I think, the most unique one? The, the most unique one is learn to be embarrassed. But the most important one is number three. Learn to trust God. God. Do you trust God tonight? Do you trust Him? Father God, we thank You and we praise You for Your Word. We pray, God, You would be with this time of invitation. Lord, we just turn this, this over to You. We're, Lord, we're mindful of those that are hurting tonight. We think of our neighbor. God, I pray that You'd help us to be the encouragement to them that we ought to be. 
We pray, Father, we are so thankful for the souls that we've seen saved over the last few weeks. And Lord, the 14, I believe 14 souls that have been saved this year made professions of faith in this church. God, we are so thankful. I pray, Lord, that we would not stop that this church would continue to march forward, even through the madness of everything that's going on in our society. God, that we would be faithful. Lord, we would trust you. We would work. God, that we wouldn't stop. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Turn to hymn number 500. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, as we sing. Pass. This is as private, as personal as we can make it for you. I remember this song. What a song. Years ago, I remember I was sitting at a summer camp. And um, I knew I was called. God called me into the ministry when I was 12 years old. I was sitting in a summer camp and the pastor had got up and talked about uh, a conscience that was seared. And he talked about how the, the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit becomes more and more distant. And I, I remember getting on my knees and I, the, the thing that bothered me that day at camp was I thought about how often, how real that calling was at the beginning and, and how much everything else kind of crowded it out. And God, it was like God tapped me on the shoulder and he said, you know what? You're not even affected by this anymore. It didn't even bother you that you've been called into the ministry. And I went to the altar because I was afraid God was done talking to me. It's interesting because years later I was in a Bible college class. And uh, we had gone over uh, God's redemptive work and we had talked about it. And, and the pastor had said some things just in passing. And then I, 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 and I was fine with it, but then one of the college kids, later on we were talking, and he started really complicating salvation. You know, did you understand repentance? Did you understand this? Did you understand that? And the whole thing, and, 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 and it started making me doubt my salvation. And I remember when I started praying about it, thinking about it, the whole thing, I remember one of the things that came to mind was sitting there at that camp. And I remember thinking, you know, I know God called me into the ministry. But here I am sitting here wondering if I'm even saved because of what someone said. Maybe I ought to go back to the Bible. That's really when I learned that it's far better to look at what the Bible says about your salvation than somebody's opinion. I always found faith in the Bible when I started trusting in myself. But it's funny how God used that calling years later to actually give me peace in another area of my life. Amen. Pass me not. Every Christian should say that. I think when we get to the point, I think of about a missionary I heard about years ago. He was walking down the street and he had been severely persecuted. Years and years he had been persecuted, 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 like, like to death almost persecuted. He was like a Bruce Olson, Bruchko type of a guy. And um, he hadn't gone through any persecution and it ticked away for months. And one day he's walking down the street and he's like, I haven't felt any persecution for a long time. And he, he starts praying and he goes, God, am I doing something wrong? And a few moments later, he wakes up on the ground and he looks next to him. He had been knocked out cold. He looks next to him and there's a brick. Somebody had thrown a brick and hit him in the head. And he's laying flat on his back. And as he comes to, he looks up and he says, thank you, Lord. Thank you. 
No, and I think sometimes we get that way with invitations. We get to the point where we haven't been to an altar in years. And I'll tell you, one of the signs of a church that has a tender heart is always the altar. It's always the altar. Um, that's why so many contemporary churches today have gotten rid of the altar call. Is because, why well, have it? It's embarrassing. It's, it's, uh, no, it's a time of going to God while he's still working on your heart. Thank God for the old time churches that do altar calls after services. Brandon, would you close us in prayer tonight? Lord, thank you for this day, Lord. I just pray that, uh, Lord, you would be uh, willing to use the altar, Lord, that you would, when we feel conviction, Lord, uh, Lord, just act on it. I pray, Lord, that uh, as we go about our week, that we would be uh, thinking, Lord, about the next person that we can talk to you about, Lord, that uh, that's constantly running through our mind, Lord, that we may give presence to anything else. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be with us as we go home and go about the rest of our week. You're safe on Sunday in your name. Amen. Amen.